section to introduce the information needed to successfully capture and monitor your drone data. It will outline how you can employ ground control in order to assess the accuracy of the L1 dataset. For this process we will be using an MLID GNSS receiver, along with the same NTRIP license which was used to collect the custom network RTK data. Finally, we will also aim to find solutions for certain issues that may arise when out on site. Ultimately, the aim of this module is to show you how an L1 survey will generally be performed and get you comfortable with the working procedures at hand. Firstly, I am going to provide a brief introduction to the survey area used to conduct our drone flight. The survey area presents a farm in the heart of Northumberland with a good distribution of both man-made and natural features. Generally, there is not too much dense vegetation with only a small amount lining the railway line on the right-hand side. That is why dual echo mode was selected over triple echo mode, as it was not a priority for the LiDAR to penetrate a large amount of tree cover. Instead, the emphasis was placed on maximising the number of returns to the sensor and generating a high-density point cloud. The size of our survey area was roughly 0.052 km2. This is not that large an area, however there will still need to be a sufficient number of checkpoints available so we can assess the elevation of the LiDAR data at different locations across the survey site. Before flying your drone, it is worth doing a reconnaissance of the site so you can get a feel for the survey area and understand what risks there are. Running along the south side of the survey area there is a road, so it is worth putting some spotters out to watch out for oncoming traffic. Secondly, along the east side there is a rail track, so we need to ensure the drone does not drop below a 50 metre flying distance. If an oncoming train approaches and the drone is near the track, we need to take manual control and fly the drone away from the track to prevent driver distraction. The site is also relatively flat and exposed, so even though the conditions are calm at the moment, we need to keep an eye on the wind conditions to ensure it does not exceed the 50 meter per second wind limit of the M300. So far in the DJI Pilot app we have outlined the mapping parameters for our topographic survey mission. Once the drone has been assembled at the takeoff point and the necessary safety checks have been completed, the drone is ready for flight. Firstly, confirm that the drone's takeoff point is in a clear, open sky location that is not located directly near any electronic or steel objects. If you are operating in a location close to any objects of this type, the drone will not take off due to the magnetic interference. The error is there for safety reasons, as magnetic interference can sometimes cause a drone to lose control and in some cases can even cause a crash. Before engaging the mapping mission, ensure that the IMU and the L1 has warmed up for 3-5 to five minutes to start the flight. Once the IMU is stabilised, you should receive a notification in the DJI Pilot app saying that the payload INS IMU has warmed up and the L1 is ready for flight. It is essential the IMU has warmed up before each flight, otherwise you may receive abnormal IMU errors when processing the raw data in DJI Terra. If you are hot swapping batteries on a drone, it is not necessary to reinitialize the IMU before restarting the flight. For custom network RTK, it is important to ensure that the RTK network is fixed and not converging. The standard deviations presented on your smart controller should be at the millimeter level. If you are unable to connect to the RTK network, ensure your drone is located in an area with clear open skies and the latest firmware is installed on your smart controller, L1 and M300. If this still doesn't work, you can change the mount point on your NTRIP login. If all else fails, try switching your drone off and on to see if the connection becomes fixed. Alternatively, the PPK workflow can be adopted and the RTK function can be disabled on the smart controller. For those using the DRTK2 base station to receive GNSS corrections, ensure that the base station is in mode 5 and connected to the smart controller. If you are using a PPK workflow, the flight can be uploaded without an RTK connection. Should you lose the entry RTK connection during flight, the mission will automatically pause until the RTK connection returns to the fixed status. If you toggle the maintained positioning accuracy mode on the smart controller, the RTK will resume for an additional 10 minutes with decreasing accuracy. If the mission pauses halfway through the flight, the raw data will be split into two separate folders on the microSD card. To process this data as a single LAS file, the folders can be merged before processing in DJI Terra, or the data can be processed as two separate projects in DJI Terra and merged in a TerraSolid software. We are now in a position to load our flight path. If we press the play icon, we should see a pre-flight check page pop up. Ensure all the settings are correct and as previously allocated. Sometimes your controller may display a radial distance error and it won't upload the flight path. In a situation like this, try removing the maximum flight distance and it should allow you to successfully load the flight mission to the drone. When we press next, the flight path is ready to be uploaded to the drone. 
Do one final check to confirm the RTK is still fixed. At the end of this mission the drone will automatically return to the home point. Now let's click upload flight mission to begin the survey. For your LiDAR dataset, ground control points, also known as GCPs, can be used as a form of quality assessment. Technically they operate as checkpoints as they are used to verify the accuracy of the survey in the XYZ direction. GCPs are used in the aero triangulation process and improve the accuracy of the ortho photo, whereas the checkpoints are used to verify the output of the reconstruction. The first step is to ensure that the GCPs are spaced evenly across the survey area. Considering the size of the site is 0.052 km squared, we don't need too many checkpoints to assess the accuracy. However, we place seven control points down so we can assess the accuracy of the data set for points at the centre and the periphery of the survey area. There is no set rule of thumb for deciding how many checkpoints you need. Considering that they are only checkpoints and are not used in a reconstruction process, you can have as few or as many as you like. Just ensure that there are enough ground control points in place to suitably assess the average absolute height error for the entire area. They need to be clearly visible from above, or in our case a 60 meter flying kite, so they are visible in a process point cloud. For the areas in the centre of the compound, a spray paint was used to mark the points. Control point 7 used a corner of a road marking, as this would be clearly visible in the scan. This is not recommended practice, however considering the traffic was quiet at the time and we were in a remote area, it was safe to establish this as a checkpoint. Our points were marked with an MLID GNSS receiver. There are other GNSS solutions available from manufacturers such as Leica or Trimble. For redundancy, six measurements were collected from each control point across the site. The receiver was recording data for 15 seconds at a time on each checkpoint to ensure the corrections were fixed. Static GNSS receivers can also be used to establish known points in the survey and further improve the accuracy. Alternatively, you can establish the points as part of a control network with a total station and survey them in using a traverse. Or we'll highlight some of the variables that could go wrong with the survey and provide solutions to these problems. Firstly, if the drone is on low charge when you are partway through the mission, you can hotswap the batteries, meaning that the batteries can be changed with the drone still turned on. It's important that the drone is turned on when changing the batteries, so it resumes the flight mission from where the survey was stopped. When it comes to post-processing the data, it will be stored as two separate LES files. However, the raw data can also be imported into the same folder and processed in DJI Terra to have it processed as a single LES file. It's important the batteries are removed and replaced one at a time to keep the drone powered on. The dual battery configuration is one of the enhanced safety features on the M300. That means one battery will successfully power the drone, even if the other fails. If the weather conditions suddenly turn when conducting your flight mission, it's important to switch your M300 to manual flight mode by flicking the switch in the middle to ATI mode and then back to GPS. Safely return the drone to the home point and wait for the conditions to ease. You should not be operating your M300 and wind speeds higher than 15 meters per second. If it starts to rain while conducting your survey, the drone should be returned to the home point. The L1 can still technically fly in rainy conditions, but the final dataset will be affected by the wet weather. For weather conditions that are foggy or misty, the drone can still be flown. However, the flying height will need to be reduced so you can maintain visual line of sight on the drone at all times. For instance, if you are planning on flying your drone at a 100 meter altitude, Reduce the size of the survey area and change the flying height to 50 meters. The drone automatically comes with beacon lights. However, in heavy fog, the M300's vision system can be affected by the low visibility. Fly with caution if the GNSS signal is too weak. If you are unable to clearly see the drone during flight, the GNSS signal is too weak, we would recommend returning the drone to the home point to wait for the conditions to ease. The L1 can also be used for nighttime flights. If you are flying the drone at night, ensure that the drone is visible and you can see the beacon lights on the M300. The outputs from the drone will only be presented in terms of reflectivity, height and return. Therefore, RGB colouring does not need to be enabled on the smart controller. Lastly, we will cover what to do if you lose RTK connection. You can maintain data quality even if the RTK connection drops on the drone. Enable maintain positioning accuracy mode on the smart controller so you do not lose RTK connection when flying. On older versions of firmware, the drone would have paused the flight and hovered at a safe altitude until the RTK returned to a fixed status. Now the drone will fly with decreasing positional accuracy for an extra 10 minutes before losing RTK connection. If you still can't establish an RTK connection after 10 minutes, return the drone to the home point and try to reconnect to the network from there.